Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's web conference, the California ISO Board of Governors meeting. Please note that all audience member lines are in a listen-only mode until we reach the public comment section. We will provide you with instructions on how you can add a public comment at that time. If at any time you require technical assistance, please send a private note to me, the event producer, via the chat panel in WebEx. With that, I'll turn the call over to Roger Collington. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome everyone to the California ISO Board of Governors meeting. Let me go ahead and take roll of our board members. Um, Chair Galitova. Present. Vice Chair Bagwad. Present. Governor Borenstein. Present. Governor Leslie. Present. And Governor Shorty. Present. Thank you, Governors. All present and accounted for, and we have a quorum. Let me turn it over to you, Chair Galitova, for our uh, next agenda item. Thank you so much, Roger, and welcome, everybody. At this time, do we have public comments on items not on the agenda today? Okay, Please. if you can open the lines, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to give a public comment, please feel free to place yourself into the queue by dialing pound two into your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name, affiliation, and public comment. Again, dialing pound two will place you in the queue. One more call. Dialing pound two will place you into the public comment queue. It would appear we have no public comments at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Roger, back to you for the minute. Thank you, Angelina. We need a decision on the general session minutes and we have Four dates, February 3rd, 2021, March, I'm not sure if that's a typo or not. Stacey? I, I think that, that February 3rd should not be there, Roger. Apologies. I, I thought so. That's what it wasn't just roughly, but I appreciate the test. <laughs> <I'm doing it. laughs> General session met from March 24th, 2021, April 21st, 2021, and the joint session on May 6th, 2021. And we can do that as a group or we can do them individually. I'll start as a group unless anyone has any objections to that. Can I have a motion? Roger, we, Roger, we can't do it as a group because I was not at the May 6th meeting, so I can't vote on it. Good gosh. Oh, fair enough. Okay, well, let's do the March 24th and April 21st, 2021 minutes. And so can I have a motion for that? So moved. Second, uh, Jan. Moved. Jan second. Um, and let me go ahead and take the roll um, for that motion. Um, Chair, or, uh, Vice Chair Bogwat? Aye. Governor Borenstein? Aye. Chair Galitova? Aye. Uh, Governor Leslie? Aye. And Governor Shorey? Aye. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the catch on that, Asha. I appreciate it. Uh, now let's have a motion for the general session minutes from the May 6, 2021 joint session with the um, EIM governing body. Um, can I have a motion for that, please? So moved. Second. Second. I think we had uh, Severin second, and I'm sorry, Mary, was that you that moved? Yeah, sure. I moved it. I moved it, and okay. I think Mary fucking did, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll let I'll let Stacy sort that out, and uh, let me go ahead and take your your vote. Um, Governor Bogwaz. Hi, okay. Evening. Okay, Governor Bornstein. Aye. Governor Galitova? Aye. Governor Leslie? Aye. And Governor Shorey? Aye. Excellent. Thank you, Governor. That motion passes as well. Appreciate it. And back to you, Angelina. 
Thanks, Roger. Okay, CEO report, Elliot Manger. Thank you very much, Chair uh, Galitva and Governors. Um, appreciate the opportunity today to share some of the highlights uh, from my CEO report. I know you've all had a chance to read it, but I think there are a number of key themes I'd like to reemphasize today, uh, particularly with respect to summer readiness, uh, transmission infrastructure issues, uh, the energy imbalance market, and our new energy storage enhancements initiative. As I have been stressing continuously, and I think all of you have been emphasizing as well, last summer was one of the most essential messages coming out of last summer was the importance of effective communication and coordination across the entire stakeholder spectrum. This last several weeks has involved a lot of activity on that front. On April 15th, we hosted our Summer 2021 Leadership Roundtable. While we benefited from the participation of 18 utilities and other organizations from across the West as we reviewed the key lessons learned from last summer, looked at the supply demand fundamentals for this summer, and reviewed all the current actions underway and, and any additional steps we may take either individually or collectively to be as prepared as possible for this summer. I think it was a very, very positive conversation. Uh, the following week, our operations group conducted tabletop exercises <clears throat> with the adjacent balancing authorities across the West just to make sure that real-time communications and coordination will be as effective as possible particularly during potentially stress grid conditions this summer. On, on May 4th, we also participated in a very productive workshop hosted by the California Energy Commission through its Integrated Energy Policy um, Report, where we took another look at the CEC fundamentals, compared notes with, with the CAISOs members tied out, and I think we all have a pretty good sense that the bottom line for the summer, as you'll hear later today uh, through the summer assessment, is that Significant progress has been made in, in increasing the generation stack. Uh, I think that our infrastructure is, is likely to be in, in better shape compared to last summer, uh, but we do have residual risk uh, related to uh, significantly below average hydro conditions, wildfires, and of course, the probably the greatest potential exposure of another west-wide heating event, uh, which will stretch the system and require significant mobilization, including on the demand response side. So we're we'll, looking forward to the presentation on that front. I also wanted just to note that uh, one of the other topics that came out of the Summer Readiness Roundtable was a, was a request by some of the utilities to make sure that we have as effective communication, potentially through the RC, on wildfire risk. So if one of our entities starts uh, running into wildfire problems, we're going to make sure that that information is disseminated across the interconnection so others can do contingency planning on that front. And we're also going to make sure that as part of the Flex Alert mobilization that we include the publicly owned utilities and the CCAs in that campaign as well. So we touch as much California load <coughs> as possible. So the summer assessment uh, today, you'll hear the bottom line. We shared it yesterday as well with the California Assembly Utilities and Energy Committee. That was, a, I think, a very productive meeting. It was, uh, it was good to be, I think, very much on the same page with President Batcher at the CPC and Chair Hochschild at CDC. Uh, and I think everybody gets a sense of the, uh, the three entities working very well together, uh, aligned in our analytics, aligned in our view of what risks we're facing, and aligned in our, our response. I also wanted just to mention, of course, that our full package of summer enhancements uh, has been submitted to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, where we await guidance from the Commission. Of course, I want to note uh, that certainly includes the issues of wheel-throughs. Uh, again, I want to acknowledge the importance and, and the contentiousness of that issue. Uh, quite frankly, we recognize it's, it's a key issue of, uh, that we all need to continue working together on. I've appreciated even, even in the midst of a dispute, the continued open lines of communication and coordination <clears throat> with adjacent utilities. I think we all recognize this is something we need to solve together. And tomorrow, uh, we will be putting out an announcement for a set of listening sessions and workshops that will be commencing in July to start working on the long-term solution to that very tricky and important uh, SEAM issue. So, Again, I uh, really appreciate all the, all the help on, on that topic, and I just want to make sure that all of our stakeholders recognize our, our absolute commitment to, to getting that issue into a, 
into a better place. And then finally, just wanted to emphasize and to, to round out the issue of communication for the summer, one of the things our communications group is going to be doing is we're going to be focusing on much greater advanced communication coordination this year. We're going to be offering a seven-day-ahead weather forecast so that we can try to anticipate stress grid conditions more effectively. Uh, we will be using all of the tools at our disposal to communicate in terms of social media, web, through the Flex Alert campaign, and of course, direct communication with the utilities so that we can keep a really close tab on operating conditions and anticipate contingencies and stress conditions uh, better, quite frankly, than we did last year. That will promote better decision-making, optimization of resources, and ultimately allow consumers to anticipate when they be, may be called upon to help us avoid rotating outages. As you saw in my report, I also emphasized, I think it's very important for all of us in the sector right now to recognize that we're going through another cycle of, of a big um, set of really important issues on the transmission infrastructure side. I have reported out to you that our cluster 14 of interconnection requests came in between April 1st and April 15th. Uh, it was an overwhelming response. We had uh, 373 projects totaling 111 gigawatts of new requests, with about two-thirds of that being from stationary battery st storage resources. It, that was in addition to the 306 projects from earlier clusters, totaling 70.7 gigawatts. The cluster 14 applications were actually almost two and a half times the 155 applications received in cluster 13, which was our second largest batch. So like many transmission providers around the country, uh, and particularly acute here in California with the kind of procurement and construction that's going to be necessary in the next several years, particularly with the OTC retirements and with the Avalon Canyon coming offline in 2025. Uh, we have a lot of work to do here at the ISO and the partners with the utilities to make sure that we can process these requests as efficiently. We are looking for potential reforms, additional ways to expedite the processing of all these queue requests. It places a tremendous uh, demand on human resources, study engineers to get through them all. And then, of course, lining that up with the, with the subscription processes and the contracting process. We have a lot of work to do, but I've also wanted to really emphasize uh, that in addition to the Q reform, we really need to keep our eye on the ball in terms of working with the utilities on substation and network upgrade readiness. You know, we're facing 5,800 megawatts of resource retirements here in California in the next several years. And we absolutely have to make sure that we're able to get the next generation of resources onto the grid as expeditiously as possible to maintain reliability. And as I noted uh, in my report, we will face significant reliability problems if we cannot connect the next wave of clean energy resources to the grid in a timely fashion. So this is all hands on deck, a lot of work with the utilities to make sure we have state awareness, any delays, uh, and we all need to be as efficient and as cooperative and as coordinated as possible to make that happen. I'm also uh, encouraged uh, our Vice President of Transmission Infrastructure Planning, Neil Miller, who you'll hear from later today, has just kicked off uh, late last week a new 20-year transmission planning process in close cooperation with the California Energy Commission and the CPUC. Uh, this is an opportunity to get much more specific about the type of transmission capacity the state's going to need to meet its clean energy objectives. And not only to talk about planning, but to really drill down now, I think, increasingly into the on-the-ground issues around permitting and siting, and, and equally importantly, the actual subscription processes to create the business demand for these new lines and to figure out which ones make the most sense for California <clears throat> and our partners across the West. Turning briefly to the energy imbalance market, um, of course, we continue to make progress on the analysis of data from last summer around the CAISO's performance and the sufficiency test. I have another, another set of meetings scheduled on that topic. And of course, the governance review committee work continues to be of significant importance. I was very pleased to see the vote out from both the EIM governing body and the governing board back on May 6th for the first, part, for the first set of enhancements for EIM governance. Uh, that group has now turned its full attention to the issues of joint authority. Uh, there's a lot of good diplomacy and back and forth working on the latest set of proposals. This is an absolutely critical issue for all of us to get this uh, issue resolved in a, in a positive, constructive fashion. I'm really looking forward to working with all the stakeholders and, and bringing back to you here in the next couple of months a proposal that we think is, is worth supporting and, and moving forward on. This is a critical gating condition for the next stages of conversations around the day ahead market and keeping our broad EIM coalition together and continue to produce economic and environmental value. 
across the West. I noted the, in the launch of our new energy storage enhancements initiative. This is a really exciting effort for the ISO to work with the storage industry to sort of look beyond this summer where we'll be using minimum state of charge requirements on the day ahead basis uh, to really guarantee reliability to a more sophisticated look at market design evolution and pricing parameters and also into different durations and different chemistries to make sure that our market really unlocks the full value of energy storage for the people of California. So we're very excited, really appreciate the collaboration uh, with the storage industry on that. And then finally, I'll just note, really excited um, to last week have been able to announce two fabulous additions to the executive team here at the California ISO. Uh, Anna McKenna has been named as the Vice President of Market Policy and Performance, stepping in behind Mark Rothleder. I think many of you know Anna. She's just a fabulous collaborator, great creative problem solver, really going to help take our market policy team to the next level. And, of course, Didi Sabaki has stepped in as our new Vice President of Operations. And Didi is just a, a great talent, transformational leader, really excited to have both of these folks join us on the officer team and lean in. Last note, uh, I think many of you might have seen a really – I think an encouraging article a couple of weeks ago in the LA Times really appreciated the coverage from, from Sammy Roth, uh, noting our 94.5% clean energy penetration record on the 26th of April. Uh, we all noted it only lasted for about four seconds, but those were pretty poignant <laughs> four seconds. And certainly a nice point to note uh, that, you know, certainly confidence builder that we're making progress, but also a reminder, and, and Sammy noted as well, we've still got work to do. Uh, we've got to keep our head down to look at that full portfolio of resources that are going to be necessary to maintain reliability. Uh, but it's okay once in a while to step back and have a little smile on the path to reliable decarbonization. So appreciated that. Thank you for the time and, and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Elliot. This is great. And I'd just like to note that it was great we had this record setting of 94.5% renewables on the grid particularly because April 26th is the Chernobyl disaster anniversary. So it's poignant on that level as well that renewables are the answer for the future as we continue to 100% renewable energy and deep decarbonization for our economy. Well, thank you for noting that, Chair Galitova. And, uh, yes, any other questions or feedback? Uh, Elliot, I have a quick question for you. Uh, thank you. I thought this report was excellent, and I'm very excited about the new staff. Congratulations to uh, Anna uh, on her new role. And I just want to harken back to your page two of four, particularly this transmission section, and to this last sentence that you did not put in italic and bold, but I still think it's kind of italic-y and boldy, which is um, this analysis ISO has done that basically we need 10 gigawatts more a procurement uh, to get us through 2025 at Diablo Canyon, and I'm just, with, 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 with Diablo Canyon retiring. So I'm just wondering, is, is that the beginning of a conversation we're in, or how's that going to work, given that we can't yeah, no, this 10 gigawatts more? Okay. No, no, thank you for asking, um, Member Leslie. I, I think um, we have – very much uh, engaged with the California Public Utilities Commission on this specific topic as part of their existing you know, proposed rulemaking on, on procurement. I think the default setting there from the PUC was about 7,500 megawatts. Our folks uh, have dug into that issue as well. We've looked at, you know, the different patterns of load volatility, resource uncertainty, just the, the, the need for net qualifying capacity, and, and, and our team has actually advanced the fact that we think all, all things considered, we need even more than what the CPC has been talking about to get the state back into a more comfortable position with respect to reserve margin and to address the kind of resource and load volatility. So that is being actively evaluated and discussed uh, at the CPC. We'll see what their ruling is here in the next couple of months. But that has been our perspective that uh, the state really, if you, especially if you look beyond 2025 to 2027, 2030, uh, we have a steep climb ahead of us to get the amount of energy and capacity back on the system uh, to, to keep the lights on in California and achieve these clean energy objectives. And we encourage the state to really lean in and, and make sure that the procurement levels are sufficient. Thank you, because um, the RA determination also impacts our transmission, correct? 
It, it absolutely does. <clears throat> and this is another reason why I'm, I'm really encouraged uh, about this new partnership we have with the CEC and the CPC to really kind of step back and really dig deep into what transmission lines need to be built across the West and into California to get the kind of resource and resource diversity that California needs. And right now the Biden administration is prioritizing transmission investment. So we would be in a good position to, um, to compete for dollars from the federal government if we identified what we needed. I think that's, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That's exactly right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more further questions, I should look up, pass it back to you. And thanks again for, uh, appreciate all your support and to all of our, our colleagues and, and partners on the call today. We've just really appreciated all the input and, and all the work together here that's in getting ready for the summer. Any additional questions? Okay, um, moving on to the next item that ties into the very important decision we'll be making on joint authority um, and the EIM Governance Review Committee and all of their hard work. Uh, so Therese Hampton, the chair of the GRC, will be giving us a report. And thank you so much, Therese, for your leadership and for all the hard work for the G GRC, especially as we move into tackling um, the joint and complex issue of joint authority. So look forward to your report. Great, thank you, Tara Galitva and governors. Uh, happy to be with you today. And similar to Elliot's comments and on behalf of the GRC, we really wanna thank you for the discussion we had um, during the joint session and the approval of part one of the governance proposal. We are very encouraged by that and there are steps underway to begin to implement that with the body of state regulators, the regional issues forum, and it's our understanding that KAISO staff will be working on modifications to governance documents to bring to you uh, for your final approval. Um, but uh, with that, we're in this part one and this part two uh, approach to this with delegation of authority being the key focus of part two. We, the GRC has been working on that since March. Um, we've kind of uh, got a, process that we built out to, to get to some solutions there. Um, over the last month or so, we've been doing one-on-one -on -one outreach with stakeholders to get, their to get their perspectives, specifically on the scope of joint authority and dispute resolution. Those were the areas where we really got the most comment, maybe some differences of views and perspectives. And so last week, uh, with the input from the stakeholders that we received, we shared a straw proposal that modifies our previous proposal on the scope of joint authority and dispute resolution. And really we're designed to reflect the input that we've received, try to find kind of the, the right balance from what we've heard from stakeholders. And we're holding a stakeholder workshop tomorrow afternoon to discuss the proposal and get feedback. And we're gonna take written comments um, on both the proposal and the workshop discussion uh, through Friday, June 4th. And so based on what we hear both tomorrow and uh, what we see in written comments, we'll determine our next steps um, with that. If we feel that we really kind of heard uh, all, all that we need to hear, we will move forward with a proposal to bring to you for your consideration. If we feel like we need to iterate a little bit on a couple of things, we will make you know another step of iteration and then bring something forward. Uh, like, like I've said before, we are trying to, to uh, move the delegation of authority issue, um, you know, at an appropriate pace um, and, and get to a solution that kind of meets the, the general interest of all the stakeholders. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Therese. Thank you for running such an inclusive and open process. It has been, it has been very transparent and, and very professional and, and very thorough. So I think stakeholders really appreciate that tremendously as we move these important issues of delegation of authority and dispute resolution forward. Any questions for Therese from the board? Okay, we'll continue all the hard work and keep everybody informed as we move forward with this important process. Thank you, Therese. Thank you.
Moving on to item number five, decision on audit committee membership. Roger. Yeah, thank you, Angelina. Um, I understand the board has expressed the desire to um, expand the membership of the audit committee now that we once again have a full board, and that is the um, item before you uh, at, at the present. And, and so um, I will move it back to the chair of the audit committee, Mary, as to whether she has a nomination for that uh, third membership. Yes, we'd like to nominate our newest board member to join us, Jan, uh, on our audit committee. She sat in today. She's going to be a great addition. She has tons of experience, um, and we welcome her participation. So I, I happily nominate her to the audit committee. And um, is there any comments, uh, questions, or anything else from the board? And then we can move to a motion on that. Great decision, and welcome, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to joining the committee. Roger, Excellent. do you need a motion? Um, yeah, I, I do have, I have a motion that I'm going to read. Um, and so unless there's, if there's no more questions, I'll go ahead with the motion. Move it. the ISO Board of Governors elect Jan Shorey to serve as a member of the Audit Committee effective May 19, 2021, which will now consist of Mary Leslie as the chair, Osh Bogwa, and Jan Shuri. I have a motion, please? I so move. Osh, Mary? I think second was Mary. And um, Governor Bogwa, your vote, please? Aye. Governor Borenstein? Aye. Governor Galitova? Aye. Governor Leslie? Aye. Governor Shorey, you, you even get a vote. I was going to ask if I got the vote on <laughs> You do, but you can't vote. No, we're not going to allow that. No. <laughs> Aye. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Governors. And the motion passes, and I'm thrilled to have you on the audit committee as well, Governor Shorey. Uh, now I just move right on to the next item of Greg Fisher is going to join us if he has not already. Um, and this is a decision on the board selection policy, which, um, as you will, most, most of you will recall, we had brought to the board uh, last July and we deferred it due to various presses of business. And um, it is the same that, that came to the board in uh, July of 2020. Um, but Greg will brief you on that, and I would like to thank Greg and um, Burton Gross and other members of the legal team who worked very hard on um, putting this together and working with stakeholders, as well as Stacey Crowley's group and Peter Colucci and others working with the stakeholders. So um, it was really a good effort to do a refresh that was um, timely and uh, maybe overdue for many years on the board selection policy. Um, Greg, are you on? Roger, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, let me turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, your time today. Uh, oh, I just got indications in. Everybody can hear me. Uh, so uh, just a little bit of background on this item, uh, in addition to what Roger has provided. Uh, you know, we believe that the uh, board selection process has been working well over time. Uh, however, in discussions uh, dating back to even 2019, with the sector lead to actually run this process. Uh, we were, you know, in discussions about how it was working and really they indicated that the policy and the process could actually use some uh, modification and, and really modernization, if you will. And so we uh, worked closely with them and then we uh, stakeholded the, pro uh, the policy itself uh, back in 2019 and 2020. Uh, and then as Roger mentioned, we brought it to the board last July Nothing has changed since then. Uh, this is simply uh, bringing the same policy back to you uh, for your uh, consideration at this point. And I'd like to give a little bit of background on, on you know, what the policy is so everybody can understand it and then how uh, we propose changing it. So uh, it was adopted in 2005, uh, and since then, obviously, the, the ISO has gone through a lot of changes in its footprint and uh, technology available for its operations. The policy itself consists of three major components. 
Uh, one is a set of qualifications for the potential candidates for the board. Uh, two, uh, there's a defined set of stakeholder sectors that we have come up with that make up uh, ultimately the board nominee review committee, and those are led by uh, sector leads. The third uh, major component is really the process itself by which the uh, committee, um, with uh, the assistance of an executive search firm, conducts that search for candidates and then vets them ultimately into a list for the governor of California as a recommendation for their appointment. And so, uh, you know, I don't need to tell you, but the ISS footprint and market have evolved considerably uh, in the last 16 years. Uh, we have new market offerings, new technologies, and even new types of market participants that didn't exist back when this was written. Uh, and then management now proposes then that we uh, uh, provide the following changes that are germane to this uh, policy. And I'm going to go through them uh, a little bit in detail after I list them. So the first one is an enhanced introductory section uh, that updates the description of the ISO's current role and corporate structure. Uh, it includes uh, new additions to our uh, footprint and, and responsibilities. Uh, the second one is that uh, we propose various revisions to the, state, the stakeholder sectors themselves for the nominee review committee uh, so that we can recognize new types of stakeholders uh, and improve the overall groupings of the stakeholders themselves so that they're in alignment within their own categories. Uh, third, we're going to propose an update to the actual candidate qualifications so that we align with uh, what the grid has become, as well as uh, you know, the um, you know, need for market experience and uh, other types of uh, qualifications that, again, are more important these days. The fourth one and final one really is a um, uh, flexibility provision that uh, allows ISO management some flexibility to adjust the process only in circumstances where uh, an incumbent board member has indicated an interest in reappointment, and then I'll talk about more about that uh, as we go through this. So uh, with the first one, uh, with the introduction, uh, if you'll read it, you'll, you'll see uh, it up, updates quite a bit, uh, but it really just is to provide an updated description of what we are and uh, includes the EIM as well as our RC functions. Uh, the change here really is to ensure that new stakeholders that are coming to the process and uh, introducing themselves to the ISO will really have an uh, updated understanding uh, and common understanding of what the ISO is and its, and its functions. The second change regarding candidate qualifications, uh, a little bit uh, more uh, meatier, uh, we propose changes here to update uh, under the general category of electric industry expertise um, characteristics that have gained more important in recent times, uh, including uh, qualifications such as forward-looking electric industry technology experience, uh, expertise in grid security, which is, as uh, you read the news, is becoming even more important, uh, as well as experience in other industry sectors that are closely related to the uh, electricity sector. We also propose other minor changes, uh, including experience as law professors, uh, which we already have one, uh, and uh, other prominent legal professional and nonprofit management experience because those have actually uh, served us well. Uh, finally, the updated uh, and extended qualifications, we believe will enhance the pool of available board candidates and that's a key issue uh, when it comes to doing this search. With respect to the third change proposed, uh, with respect to stakeholder uh, definitions, uh, we worked with the stakeholders on this closely uh, they were developed at the inception of the policy, and really some of them have become outdated uh, in, the, uh, in their terminology as well as their application to the current ISO um, footprint and uh, its regional outlook. Uh, we propose changes to uh, update the terminology, uh, account for certain types of entities that didn't exist in 2005, such as CCAs and energy storage resources. Uh, we wanted to clarify as well the sector or sectors in which stakeholders from outside the ISO BA um, may participate, such as EIM entities, for example. Uh, it finally, it also clarifies that a stakeholder that falls into one uh, or more sector, or sorry, more than one sector uh, definition 
has the right to choose its own sector to participate, but once they do so, they obviously have to stay in that sector, and, and of course, they can't participate in more than one. And then finally, the, uh, the um, total number of 36 stakeholders. Uh, we've given ourselves a little bit of flexibility there in the event that uh, six uh, participants in a sector do not step forward and want to participate. Final change that we're proposing uh, is respect to Section 4.3, which is a new section. Uh, this will provide uh, the ISO the opportunity to gauge whether uh, an incumbent is interested in reappointment and then uh, would allow us to uh, be, be um, iterative with the governor's office as well as stakeholders on the nominee review committee uh, to see if a process should be run or if other modifications to the process should be made to shortcut uh, what we need to do to fulfill that obligation under the policy. Those are the changes. Uh, with respect to our stakeholdering process, uh, as I mentioned, it was done some time ago, but we've been in close contact with the uh, sector lead since then. Uh, there has been no changes uh, in position uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, they were largely supportive of the effort uh, they were uh, mostly supportive of every change that we made. Some had uh, proposed, a couple of had proposed a few additional changes that were considered but, but ultimately not incorporated. Uh, but I think overall uh, the revised policy meets the, um, you know, the uh, recommendations of the stakeholders, and we believe that it will obviously improve our process uh, going forward. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you, Roger, for all the hard work on this. It hasn't been updated since 2005. We were due for an update, so these are changes that I think reflect the changing market and environment to a very large extent. And, of course, we can always change the document as needed later on as well. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah, um, I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is about this addition of law professors. Uh, I was just wondering that given that academics is already in the specification, whether this is that law professors were so special they should be called out in, on top of other academics, or whether the view was law professors weren't really academic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think well, I can take that one several it's so special. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, my serious We're... comment was, was about Section 4.3, potential reappointment. It seems that this gives management the decision uh, authority to decide that uh, adjustments, and I presume what adjustments means is bypassing the search process and just having an up or down uh, endorsement of reappointment. Um, and I was a little surprised by that, but I assume that this is something that all of the stakeholder groups are comfortable with uh, if it's gotten this far and we didn't get any negative feedback about it. Um, well, is, am I interpreting this correctly? Well, so, I think we'll follow. Um, yes, it's this is something that the stakeholders are comfortable with. It's something that's vetted with the governor's office. But more importantly, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that in the sense that ultimately ISO management, and it, because it's the ISO management policy, uh, has the, I suppose, the final decision, but it's done in conjunction with the governor's office. It's done in conjunction with feedback received and input from the nominating, nomination review committee which, um, you know, would obviously be strongly considered. So um, I, I guess I wouldn't completely agree that it just gives us unvetted discretion on that from that standpoint. But, Greg, maybe you had a um, more nuanced answer, too. Yeah, that's, thanks, Roger. Uh, you know, what I will say, uh, Selvin, is that uh, that is definitely one possible outcome, you know, that we would revert to a uh, up or down. There are other outcomes that are also uh, possible, I think, within this, which is uh, to – you know, for instance, uh, look back at past searches for other candidates too, for the governor to consider, uh, you know, the ultimate 
the decision maker obviously is the governor here. And so because this includes the uh, input from that particular standpoint, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll have to gauge whether there's a uh, strong indication one way or another before we even uh, trigger this uh, you know, flexibility. So I, I, I do agree, you know, also that uh, the stakeholders have supported this. The last thing they want to do is spend, uh, you know, several hours of their time and travel and so forth when uh, there's a foregone conclusion as to who the appointee will be. And so I think they're supportive of that for that reason. I hope that helps uh, understanding. Yes, and, and it doesn't need to be said, but of course this is also done in consultation with the board member <laughs> in, as well. Yes, absolutely right. The board member, I would hope so. <laughs> it's not forced conscription. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You correct? <laughs> Well, as the board member who is next up for reappointment, yeah. I was mostly looking for reassurance. I wouldn't be looking for another law professor. <laughs> well, you don't have that degree yet, Severin? Do we want to? Do we want? Sorry, go ahead, there. I have, yeah, I just have one more. As the, as the board member who just went through this, I, I think that it, you know it is kind of interesting because. You already have the process where the, the stakeholders have given a short list to the governor to even be considered ostensibly that the governor takes that seriously, right? So you have to make that list and then the governor has to decide. Now you're in a situation where you're serving on the board and it did seem odd that you go back to the very stakeholders that already had nominated you the first time or at least put you on a short list, right? Um, and then I, I, I agree with Severon. I, I'm not, the up or down from, from ISO management puts a board member in an interesting position, actually, because I think there are situations where, there, that where the independence of a board member is critical um, and that you can't be in a situation where you have to worry that you would make a decision that you thought was best for the ISO that staff wouldn't like. So I, I do worry a little bit about this language and the vagueness of it and what it's inferring myself. Well, I think if I make a comment because I'm probably the worst case example because I think all of you know that I'm just finishing up the third year on what was Dave Olson's term. So I haven't even been confirmed yet. I've been here for about three and a half months and yet I would be up again. I will be up again, assuming I get through this year uh, at the end of the year um, to stand for a full term, assuming that goes forward. I have to say, I, I looked at this language because it did obviously uh, have direct impact, uh, and it seemed to me that what we're really dealing with is, uh, I think it's built on the understanding that at the end of the day, the governor reserves the right to appoint whoever the governor chooses to pick. And really what we're talking about is what is the process to get to that point and if the stakeholders and the governor's office are already indicating that they don't see the need, to, you know, search firms are not cheap, to be frank, so if they don't see the need to go conduct a search, then we would save some money and potentially everybody can move forward. But I would assume if there are problems on either side, that then the traditional process would be followed. So that, I hear what what you're saying, Mary, but that was my view of it, is at the end of the day, the governor oh. is going to make the decision, so. Oh, gee, and in that instance, the thought that we, that we shut the stakeholders back together to reconvene on somebody who's just, been, it makes no sense. But, but you are putting another layer on the board member, you know, and, and so I just, yeah, I, I Roger, our, if, uh, I, if, I, if I may, Mary, um, yeah. I think we're at, I think we're removing a layer is what we're, we're trying to do is if it's, um, to, to Jan's point, if it's a foregone conclusion from the governor's office that the sitting board member whose term is expiring and who has indicated an interest in being reappointed, that the governor is so inclined to do so and doesn't feel the need for an executive search, it removes that layer of then doing two things. One, as Jan stated, um, the expense, the time, the energy that goes into an executive search to what has in the past when this became an issue. It hasn't been an issue recently, I don't think, um, subject to check, but in the past when it has been an issue in various contexts, it's created a lot of frustration amongst the stakeholders and the yeah. review committee. 
to go through all of the work to um, maybe come up with some potential selections and then at the end of it all saying, you know, it was a foregone conclusion ultimately. So it, I don't see yeah. this as a as management putting itself in the position. We do not want to do that. We're not, um, we are not involved in the selection. We are a conduit between the nominee review committee and the governor's office. Roger, can I make a suggestion? Um, in the minutes, in the minutes reflect our mutual understanding, the ISO management has no role to play in determining whether a board member should or should not be reappointed. Yes. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. that. I mean, I'm just. Uh, I think um, that because I I understand Mary's concern. I think this is. Hey. We all understand what this policy means, but it's not necessarily crystal clear that management has no role to play in making that decision. And I think it, it, it should be at a minimum in the minutes. Yeah, and I think it's gotta be clear. I mean, we, we have a role in the process. So I think in the, the key language in there is in the decision. Yeah, that's right. I, I think, uh, Roger, what Ash is asking makes sense. I think you should clarify it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can. Um... And, also, yeah. and, and also, the minutes can also reference, I know we all understand it, but it's in consultation with stakeholders and board members as well. And we, yeah, we can reflect that in the minutes. So what I'll do is the motion will state, um, you know, what we usually say as described in the attached memorandum, uh, say and as discussed at the board. And, and you know, with with respect to the language with law professors and, and law law experts um, and other academics, we, you might just want to say, you know, academics, and then as an example, law professors or economics professors. <laughs> just as an example today in few. I, I, so I actually, actually I'll say with the wording. I, yeah, as I much as I don't like it, I can live with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. I think we stay with the wording. I think the um, the language to, was, I, I don't remember if that was new language or not. I have to look at the red line, but um, I think with the understanding that it's, it's an example as we state here, I think that would right. be, if, if the board members are okay with that, we can vote with that. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Are we ready for a motion? Yes, we are. So move that the Addison Board of Governors approves the revised board selection policy as described in and attached to the memorandum dated May 12, 2021, and as reflected in the discussion at the May 19, 2021 board meeting. I'll move. Angelina and second. Second, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Governor Bogwat, your vote. Aye. Governor Borenstein. Aye. Governor Galitova. Aye. Governor Leslie. Aye. Governor Shorey. Aye. Thank you very much, Governor. That is uh, been uh, the motion has been approved. Thank you, Governors. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you again for our, okay. yeah. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, item number seven, briefing on summer loads and resource assessment results, Bob Emeritt and Neil Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair Galitipa, Board of Governors. Uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Emeritt to present the uh, summer assessment this year, I would just like to add a few comments. Uh, first, that as Mr. Mainzer's opening comments indicated and from other presentations you've seen to this point, the actual preparatory steps that are being taken to be ready for this summer have already been communicated. But uh, Mr. Emmer will be presenting today the analysis of the supply and demand situation we're looking at going into the summer. 
this assessment is really what underpins a lot of those other preparations and assessing the conditions we expect to see. And while this is an annual event, uh, this year has obviously uh, received much more scrutiny given the, the events of last year. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Emmert, who's our Senior Manager of Resource of Interconnection Resources to walk you through the presentation itself. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Neil. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you are all doing well. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. The summer assessment is a report that we put together every year and its primary purpose is to inform the ISO operations as well as market participants and also uh, broader stakeholders and, and public of the type of operating conditions we expect to be seen throughout the summer. And through this process, we use a, a production simulation model that runs 2,000 simulations based on historical renewable energy generation profiles in a range of load levels derived from 26 years of weather history. And out of that weather history, we develop 182 unique hourly load profiles that encompass the entire range of the weathers we've seen over that 26 years from the very mild to the very extreme. And so those are modeled in combination with a mixture of, of that historical renewable generation profiles to come up with uh, a, a unique picture with, within each of those 2,000 different scenarios from which we are able to develop a profile of distributions of probabilities of having various events occur, such as levels of operating reserves. As we did last year, this year we ran two simulations. Uh, we did a base case where the base case uh, set up the import limit where there's an import in limit within the model to make sure the model doesn't capture more imports than is really appropriate uh, based on the way the model is set up while we model all weather events within the ISO, we model the rest of WEC at one and two load conditions. And under those conditions, typically the model will find economic imports pretty readily available. So we have to set a, a limit within the model to make sure it doesn't exaggerate the amount of imports that are um, coming into the ISO. And, and the space case is to set up uh, a case to where we're looking at the historical levels and it's based on the last three years of historical uh, import levels that we've seen whenever the load is at 90% or more of the one and two peak demand and during the on-peak hours. So that's our base case. And then a sensitivity case we run, in this case we ran um, where the monthly import limits were set at the six-year average of the resource adequacy import levels procured on a monthly basis for the summer. And so it's basically assuming we don't really have any economic non-firm imports, we're just relying on the imports that are procured under the IR program. And this is designed to model conditions where imports are more limited uh, to the RA levels, such as a widehead, widespread heat event that we have last year. And those type of events where we see that all of the surplus energy that might be available for imports in the ISO is really staying home to meet uh, native load in, in other balancing authorities. The simulations assess the risk of needing to call on extraordinary measures to reduce loads that can be accessed under emergency or extreme conditions. Those measures are not included in the simulations because the capacity of those measures are difficult to quantify and it's difficult to model. And the 2021 report also presents results of a term deterministic stack analysis for the month of September. And I'll be going over the results of, of both the stochastic and the deterministic assessments. So uh, next can slide. Can Could I just ask, Bob, can I ask a question? What extraordinary measures means? I assume calling DR is not an extraordinary measure. That is correct. It's really getting into, you know, well, first of all, you've got the um, flex alert and uh, as things continue to progress, we've got the, you know, this year, the emergency load reduction programs that are that have been set up and those type of measures that the operators can take um, that typically we don't get into those measures until we see we are in uh, either close to or at a stage two operating emergency condition. I have a question too, Josh Pogwatt. So when we talk about running 
simulation, running forecasts and simulations based on 26 years of weather history. To what extent are we biasing that to reflect the fact that the weather has changed over the last 26 years? That's something we took into account when we originally chose to start at 1995 moving forward using that weather. Um, we felt that we didn't really want to go into more extreme longer periods uh, because we wanted to try to capture more of the climate change that we're seeing. And at the time we made that decision, we really, we didn't even have 20 years of history at that point. Uh, so we felt, well, we're, we're really at the minimum amount that we really need. Now that we're at 26 years, uh, we need to make the decision, do we want to uh, cap it at 26 or maybe cap it at 25 uh, and not continuing to add history to that? Uh, so that's a decision we'll be making next year, but uh, we haven't tried to do anything to actually bias it other than limiting the history to a shorter period. So you're not, you're not looking at trend lines and saying that every five years we see X, X sort of changes in average temperature or, or rainfall or things like that? No, we're just really using the profile from those 26 years and and using each of those years as as a starting point for uh, a profile of developing the load his, or the load forecast. That that this is a conversation for later, but I wonder if we should be reconsidering that moving forward because 1995 is entirely irrelevant to what's going on in 2021, in my, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Okay, so looking at the key points of the summer assessment, the ISO anticipates supply conditions for 2021 to be better than last summer. Potential challenges can arise if an extreme heat wave affects a substantial portion of the West, reducing the availability of imports into the ISO. Uh, for supply conditions, they are improved over 2020 with roughly 2,000 megawatts of new resources, plus an additional 1,000 to 1,500 of other uh, expected procurement not included in the simulations. Uh, these additional 1,000 to 1,500 megawatts are resources that we expect to be seen uh, in the month ahead RA showings that we get from the load serving entities. However, we need to note that we are in the second year of a significantly lower than normal hydro conditions, and this will impact the reliability most in late summer. The one and two load forecast is relatively unchanged from 2020 uh, at the level of 45,835 megawatts. However, the one in 10 loads are significantly higher. And to uh, really take a, a closer look at what that really means, I made a comparison between the 2020 forecast and the 2021 forecast, looking at the relationship of the higher load levels to the one and two forecast. So for 2020, uh, the one in five was 4% higher than the one in two forecast, and the one in 10 forecast was 6% higher than the one in two forecast. For 2021, the one in five remains at 4% higher than the one in two. However, the one in 10 is 11% higher than the one in two forecast. And by adding last year's extreme weather events into the historical weather database resulted in an extreme summer heat event now within the range of a one in 10 weather event. Can I just ask about that? I'm, I was surprised. So basically we added one year of data and it didn't change the one in five, uh, but it did change the one in 10. And if I understand how this distribution of 26 years works, that means it must have moved some piece of the distribution from between the 80th and the 90th percentile to between the 90th and 100th percentile. But I think that's the only way that can happen. Um, that's correct. And yes. so basically the entire update is due to last year's heat spell and I guess following on Asha's comment, uh, this, this doesn't, it seems like we should be able to do something more nuanced than that. 
in thinking about the distribution of possible uh, weather forecasts and therefore load forecasts going forward. Um, I, I'm just surprised that uh, that's the sort of state of forecasting of this sort. Um, yeah, I guess that's not uh, a question. Can I, but I'll go. Commissioner Bornstein, it, it's Neil here. If I could just add in, uh, just add a finer point to uh, Mr. Emmett's presentation. The, the relationship between the base forecast, the one and two, that is taking into account, and our, our methodologies project fairly closely off of more recent experience and generally also align very well with the Energy Commission's forecast for the next year. So to the extent that higher temperatures are being seen and that on average, and that's driving up the average expectation for load forecast, that would already be taken into account in the one and two. And oh, then we and are I, using, I, sorry? And then we are using I'm this one data opposite. as well. Sorry? I'm surprised at the opposite. I'm surprised that we are taking one year of data and allowing it to so completely shift our forecast for the top of the distribution. I mean, it's having a huge effect on the top of the distribution based on last year. And maybe that's the right way to think about it, but I would think both that we should be, all, we should try be doing other things to try to anticipate the, the high-end tail, which is of course the most important part of the distribution, and um, not overweighting just one year of data. This is Bob. Um, I, I think I need to make a clarification here. We have an entire distribution of this 26 years of, of weather-related loads. So within the distribution, we have the 1 in 10, 1 in 15, 1 in 20, you know, all the way up. It's just now that, you know, typically what we – published in these reports are the one in one and two and one in ten reports. We've sometimes we've had the one in five as well. But what's happened is an extreme weather event has basically shifted from being a one in twelve type year event to now more of a one in eight type year event. So we haven't heavily weighted anything uh, beyond just adding that one year. So it's it's just adding the likelihood of an extreme event, uh, now that we have one more extreme event added to the range of the higher end, it, it has pushed that one in 10 kind of across that point to where one in 10 now is within the range of those extreme events. Yeah, but my point is it, it's making a huge difference in the probability of a much higher load forecast at the top of the distribution, and the top of the distribution is what really matters here. And so we are, based on one year of data, and I'm not arguing that we shouldn't be anticipating much hotter circumstances, I'm just concerned that we're waiting until it happens to really make a big change in the forecast. I mean, this is all coming about from the fact that we are adding 2020 and dropping, it would be 1994, if this is a rolling 26-year window. Uh, and it's saying that the top 10, the 90th percentile, instead of being 6% 6 higher than the median, is now 11% higher than the median, which is um, a huge change. And I, I, I just worry that if this is how we're doing it, we are, and maybe it is how, maybe it's the state of the art, but it, it seems like there is, uh, there, that, that there's some pretty sophisticated climate modeling out there that might be able to tell us more about what we should be thinking about in the top tail of the distribution. I, I, I this is more a long-term argument for perhaps Mm -hmm. uh, revisiting this in, uh, in in sort of the whole process, not for changing this number for this year. Uh, obviously, it's, that's not what I'm suggesting. 
uh, Governor Borenstein, this is this is Elliot Nainzer. Um, I think consistently now, I think we now, it's a great example of why we have economists on our board with deep econometrics experience and appreciate the input. Maybe this sounds like this would be a good opportunity as we get offline to, to dive further in and see if we can get some more of your input into the mix for subsequent iterations. So appreciate the thought process and lots to think about. I think for, for, for Governor Bogwad as well, thank you for flagging these issues. All right. So if we could move to the next slide, thank you. So this slide shows the results of the stochastic modeling where the results are improved over 2020, but the conservative net import sensitivity case shows reduced levels of net imports during high demand conditions significantly affects the system reliability. So to look at the probability of the ISO system capacity shortfall shown in this table, we are looking at the base case and the sensitivity case and, and keying in on the results of what's the probability of a stage two, which is the point where operating reserves get to 6% or less, or a stage three, which is where operating reserves get to 3% uh, or less. And this is the point where we would be in, in initiating uh, firm load shedding. We also are showing this table unserved energy, which is the point where all uh, reserves have been depleted, and even beyond that, we are not able to serve 100% of the ISO load. So to look at the base case, these numbers are, um, are within the realm of probability, but they're fairly low. Uh, to put it in context, a 5% a, uh, a probability is equivalent to a 1 in 20 years. So while within the range of probabilities, uh, it is a, a somewhat lower probability. Moving to the sensitivity case, however, these numbers are significantly higher, where, uh, again, looking at the stage three emergency case of 12.5, that's equivalent to a one in eight year event. So the probabilities under those type of conditions where this particular uh, sensitivity case was designed to look at conditions where imports are only to the levels that have been procured as firm imports under the IR, IR pro, or RA program that um, under those types of conditions, we are at an increased risk, whether that be from a widespread heat event or, or some other type of uh, operating condition. So as noted earlier, the existing and new tools available to operators are not accounted for within these results, and these tools will serve to actually decrease the probability of having to shed firm load. And tight supply conditions are more likely to occur in late summer when hydro power declines to its summer low levels, particularly in September when solar ramps down earlier in the day. We can move can to I the next slide. Can I ask a question about that before we move on? The, or, well, one comment, the sensitivity case is a case where the only imports are RA, uh, but on the other hand, it assumes all of the RA shows up, right? That is correct. Um, which, I mean, historically is not accurate, though we don't know how high that would be. Right. Um, and then I was just a little confused. When hydro is low in late summer, it doesn't get low enough that you can't run the hydro plant at full power, or maybe I'm not understanding how hydro power works. Is it that the, what I think is called the head, is lower, so you're just getting less power out of it? Um, or because, I mean, you, if ever you're going to use hydro, this, these are the hours it should be used, I would think. And so I was a little confused about that. Yeah, so when, when hydro gets low, uh, two things happen. One is that you're correct, the head is lower, so you have less capacity out of it, and typically you'll have less amount of waters to, you can't run it at that capacity for the same number of hours. So uh, what the hydro operators do is they, they have some ability to save water for what they uh, would uh, expect for more extreme conditions in the day to not run it as many hours in the day, but try to save the water they do have for those particular hours. And also when it gets even more to where there's not enough to uh, operate for very many hours, we can use hydro for ancillary services, therefore freeing up other resources that, that can deliver the energy. 
So hydro um, can still be used in, in those extreme conditions, but uh, more for ancillary services than delivering energy under the most critical conditions. Okay, thanks. So this chart shows the hours that um, the worst one hour condition of each of the 2000 scenarios occurred at. And here we narrowed it down to looking at just the uh, lowest operating reserve margin from the cases where the lowest margin was 6% or less, essentially in that stage two condition or more extreme. And, and then we plotted this uh, for the hours those occurred, as well as the uh, profile for the um, solar generation. And it demonstrates that the risk is higher, highest during the day when solar is unavailable. Because uh, you can see the vast majority of these, um, the blue lines or the blue bars are in hours when we have low to no solar output. So while we have enough capacity during the daytime when, um, during the middle of the day when solar is generating, when, we, when solar declines and is no longer available and we're having to rely on our fleet minus the solar um, generation, that's when the, the probabilities are higher of running into low operating reserves. Next slide, please. So this chart shows the uh, stack analysis that we performed for the month of September where we are looking at a peak day condition at the hour of 8 p.m. And this also demonstrates reliance on imports, where for each of these bars, I, I won't go through every single number on the bars, I, I wanna focus on the imports, which are the, the orange part of the bar that demonstrates the amount of imports that we would have under each of these three scenarios, where on the far left, we see almost uh, roughly 6,000 megawatts of imports under that condition. And that number was selected as, because that was the average of imports procured for the month of September over the last six years. And under those conditions, you see that the uh, amount of resources do not quite get to the level of a 7.5% planning reserve margin, which is the, the new level of planning reserve margins from the CPUC RA program for this year. And it doesn't quite get to the 15%, the historical reserve margin we have used. Moving to the middle bar where we've added additional um, imports to get up to nearly uh, 8,500 megawatts of imports, this represents the maximum that we have seen over the last six years of RE imports for the month of September. And at this level of imports, we are able to meet both the 15% planning reserve margin as well as the 17.5% planning reserve margin. And then moving over to the far right bar, in this case, we are adding economic imports of roughly 1,000 megawatts. So these economic imports will be above the, the maximum RA contracted for amounts. In this case, we can see that we get all the way to the top dash line, which represents the day ahead forecast for August 18th of 2020, taking into account um, a 7.5% for outage rates and, and accounting for 6% operating reserves. So in that case where we have a high end of imports that we would see under these type of loads, that we're, we would be able to meet the day ahead forecast for August 18th of last year. So, so how are you estimating what the economic imports are gonna be? I missed that. It's based off of history of, of what okay. we've seen during peak periods and coming up with what we think is a reasonable assumption for an additional amount of economic imports. Okay, thanks. Um, just to and be clear, Bob, this, this stack analysis is, I would term, less sophisticated than the previous analysis. This is just comparing to the 15 and 17.5 planning reserve margins, which are pretty arbitrary numbers. Whereas the previous, I'm trying to understand what the, if you go back to the table with the 12.5%, what your, how, how that lines up. So somewhere in here, in underneath this table, 
is an assumption about uh, uh, fossil plant outages and uh, other sorts of operational problems, which uh, in the case of the stack analysis, you're actually just putting on the, uh, well, the 7.5 forced outage. Is that right? And what is the forced outage assumption under the 12.5%? So the stack analysis is really taking a look at it. I don't know, Neil, did you want to chime in first? Yes, actually, if Governor Bornstein, maybe, maybe I could just add some context to this. This is the first year we've actually provided this uh, stack analysis, which, as you pointed out, is a much less sophisticated way of looking at the issue. It's a, a kind of a, an apples and oranges, a, a different way of looking at the same challenge of identifying and communicating to stakeholders what the situation looks like this summer. One of the reasons we added the stack analysis, despite it being a less sophisticated uh, tool, is that it really honed in on the situation we're looking at at, at that critical 8 p.m. window, which was a bit of a new phenomenon that the industry was facing as peak shift occurred more and more with behind the meter solar pushing our peak loads that we serve from the grid to later in the day. So it does rely to some, uh, on a different approach but the fact that it came out with largely similar conclusions highlighting our dependence on out-of-state imports, especially under peak load conditions, was why we felt it was valuable to show both analyses, even though this is far less sophisticated. And I do, uh, this is actually another point I really wanted to jump on too, that you really highlighted the difference in terms of how forced outages are considered. In the stack analysis, we're adding up the total capacity without allowing for uh, forced outages. But in terms of what the target we're trying to have enough capacity to reach, we include in the planning reserve margin a component for the expected forced outage rates. And we do believe that between 7.2 and 7.5 is probably more reasonable for the actual average forced outage rates that we experience. Uh, now, the forced outage rates that are built into the more complex probabilistic analysis are actually more specific, and their probability is taken into account in assessing the likelihood of having a shortfall. So it's okay. a different approach. It's a different approach, uh, but this is really helping just highlight the particular risk at 8 o'clock which is otherwise pretty hard to explain to stakeholders through the more complex probabilistic results. Okay, thanks. Yeah, another way you might look at it is these three bars on um, slide six here is probably close to three of the 2000 scenarios that we see within the stochastic analysis. And as Neil was saying, the forced outage rate in the model, we actually put in historical forced outage rates uh, for each of the units, and then those are chosen of when those outages would, would occur across the summer on random draws. So the forced outage rates we see within the model are going to range from a, you know, below 5% to up to 10% uh, based on the draw and the timing of the resource outages that uh, the model randomly chooses. So for conclusions, overall, the capacity conditions are better compared to 2020, but the grid remains vulnerable to high loads and the availability of imports during widespread heat events. And load hydro conditions increase risk, particularly in late summer. The added storage in retaining 400 megawatts of generation to the reliability must run process improves expected performance for 2021. Uh, the projected new storage additions are expected to be effective at supporting system capacity needs during post-solar hours. I will note that uh, this coming summer, we will have 10 times more the battery energy storage system resources on our system compared to what we had last summer. And the operators of these systems will need to ramp up their learning curves pretty quickly 
so that they are able to be prepared to operate their facilities effectively to meet ISO needs. Some of these resources have been online for a number of months, but we still have some resources that have yet to come online. The distribution of probabilistic results based on historical weather now reflect last year's conditions. And as a result, the one in 10 conditions now reflect higher load patterns than in past year's studies. However, just to be clear again, um, the full range of the profile of uh, load forecasts are modeled. So while we kind of focus on one in 10, it's just one in 10 is just one scenario within the full range of the probabilistic range of load forecasts. And to end, improved awareness, communication, market tools, and development of contingency measures will help to increase system reliability if extreme conditions arise. So that concludes my presentation. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much, Bob, and I know we're coming up on time. I just had one very quick question. Are we comfortable that all the storage, um, especially the battery storage, is coming uh, online as scheduled and that all that we're expecting is going to be available for the summer? Well, I would say there's always a risk. Um, we've been tracking that, and, and I just took a snapshot of the conditions yesterday, and uh, one of the benchmarks was what do we expect this to be on by June 1st, and we're close to that number now, but there's still some capacity that will be coming on by July 1st and August 1st. And, and while those appear to be progressing as we expect, there's always something that could potentially come up that could delay um, the online data, some of those resources. And you will keep us posted if that were to occur? Yes, we can do that. Please. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's you know, sorry, we do, we do, we do track those. Uh, we are tracking those through the new resource interconnection process. Uh, and at this point, uh, the resources are still on track. As Bob indicated, you know, something can always happen going forward, and we'll, we'll keep you posted if that situation changes. I know. I heard about we... some fires of ships en route from China full of batteries. So. Just wanted to make sure we're not affected. Are these all battery yes, thank resources? You. The resources coming on between now and the end of and the uh, and the summer peak. Expected summer peak yeah. are batteries, yes. Yes. They're all batteries. Okay. Thank you, Governors and Chair Valitova. Uh, I would, if um, if we're done with item number seven, um, unfortunately, I'd like to circle back to item number six. Uh, we neglected to request public comment, and I understand, uh, and item number six is the decision on the board selection policy, and I understand we had um, at least one public comment, and um, so I would like to ask the operator at this time to request uh, if there is any public comment on the decision on the board selection policy, item number six. Again, if you would like to enter the queue to add a public comment, please dial pound two into your telephone keypad. When your line is unmuted, please state your name, affiliation, and comment. We have one caller on the line. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Roger. Good afternoon, Kaiso Board, Kaiso Management. This is Eric Eisenman with pg and &E. I appreciate uh, your taking these comments uh, a little bit out of order. Uh, I've been on the Board Nominee Review Committee for close to 15 years, leading the transmission owner sector. I've been very involved in this for, for a long time. First, I want to thank Greg Fisher and Quentin Foster for their engagement on this matter over the last year or two. Uh, so PG&E strongly supports this revised board selection policy. All of the proposed changes are very logical. In uh, the, the board memo, it noted that PG&E and CMUA filed joint comments. Uh, CMUA was unable to provide uh, a speaker today just because of conflicts, but they authorized me to, to say that they also support the changes. I'd, I'd especially like to note the improved language in defining the six sectors in Section 4.2. Uh, 
I feel it's really important that there's clarity as to which sector all industry segments would fall into. This includes EIM entities, CCAs, and storage providers. I would note that a couple of years ago that an out-of-state EIM entity wanted to participate in the board selection process through the, the board nominee review committee. But there wasn't really a sector that was the right fit for them. So they joined the transmission owner sector, even though that sector was meant to be the sector for transmission owners in the CAISO balancing authority. It was, it was a little awkward. We dealt with it. It was the right thing to do, but it, it showed that the policy uh, needed some updating. So. This revised policy certainly takes care of, of an issue like that. As, as has been indicated, this policy hasn't been substantively revised since 2005. So here, here's a little Monday morning quarterbacking. The policy should have been updated quite a few years ago. So with that in mind, I would encourage the board, CAISO management, and the board nominee review committee to routinely review the policy to ensure that this policy stays current. Thank, thanks for your time. Thank you, Eric. That's a really good point, and apologies for not opening up the item for public comment after we were done with the board discussion. We'll make sure not to do that again on decisional items. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Governors. I think with that, unless there are any questions on the informational reports which have been provided to the board or future agenda items to be discussed, I think we may adjourn. Anybody else have comments? Um, board members, questions? Stacy, you had indicated that Eric might want to make a statement. Uh, that, that was Eric. Okay. Oh, I, I thought I killed the brand. It was Eric. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So no more questions um, and comments. As Roger said, we can, we can adjourn. Excellent. Thank you, Governors. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your, your time and participation.